Well, I first, the bar, to the bar, je suis à Bordeaux, je veux dire quelques mots en français. Je suis vraiment heureuse de me retrouver euh, tout de part en France, euh, particulièrement à cette conférence euh, qui est si bien organisée. Euh, euh, alors, grand, grand merci pour, euh, pour cette merveilleuse organisation. Et aussi, euh, il faut dire que même si j'ai été élevée, euh, si vous voulez, au, au sein de ce sport, euh, J'ai beaucoup, beaucoup appris par euh, les, les différentes présentations qui ont été faites lors de cette conférence et c'était pour moi vraiment exceptionnel. Euh, C'est aussi pour moi euh, quelque chose de très personnel. Euh, euh, on parle lors des présentations de la vieille école et de la nouvelle école de, de catch. Euh, effectivement, mon père appartenait à la vieille école. Peut-être que je devrais même dire la vieille, vieille école, puisque euh, j'ai vu qu'on catégorise très souvent la vieille école comme commençant à partir des années 80, alors que euh, mon père a vraiment connu ces grands moments euh, à partir du début des années 50 jusqu'au milieu des années 60. Euh, quand la nouvelle vieille école a commencé, euh, J'avoue que mon père était déçu euh, parce qu'il trouvait beaucoup de ce qu'il trouvait dans les nouvelles formes de catch euh, vulgaires. C'était comme un affront à ce que lui, il considérait comme un sport. Euh, Franco-canadien, il y a quand même cette notion de l'honneur le nom de famille qui est en jeu, il n'a jamais changé son nom, il a toujours utilisé son nom propre. Et c'était quand il luttait, il représentait non seulement sa force, mais aussi il représentait sa famille. Et puis justement, euh, hier nous avons vu un film où il y avait, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on peut dire, une désaffection entre le père et la fille. Euh, pour nous, il n'en a jamais été question malgré son succès euh, énorme, euh, malgré ses voyages multiples à travers les États-Unis, euh, au, au Japon, etc., euh, euh, on n'a jamais mis en doute que pour mon père, nous, ses enfants, nous, sa famille, euh, nous étions sa priorité. Donc, il euh, y avait vraiment le sens de la famille et la famille avant tout, ce qui est une image peut-être assez contradictoire par rapport à celle que nous avons vue dans le film et celle, euh, cette image de narcissisme euh, qu'on retrouve souvent dans les images des catcheurs. Euh, il était hum humble euh, devant son public, mais fier de ses origines et fier de sa famille. Euh, je voudrais rajouter, j'adore Camus. Euh, et une des choses que j'ai toujours retenues de mes lectures de, de Camus, c'est qu'il existe plusieurs vérités. Donc, nous avons eu le bonheur de pouvoir euh, euh, percer davantage certaines de ces vérités lors de cette conférence par les multiples perspectives qui nous ont été offertes. Euh, et aujourd'hui, je propose euh, peut-être, je vais vous proposer quelques perspectives euh, peut-être un petit peu différentes, euh, aussi bien que quelques-unes qui sont très semblables à celles que nous avons déjà visitées lors de cette conférence. Euh, je voudrais peut-être souligner une réalité que nous n'avons pas encore abordée, c'est que, enfin, je sais, dans l'époque de mon père, tout ce qui se passe dans le rond de ring est légal. Alors, si quelqu'un meurt lors d'un combat, euh, on, on moins d'être, <rire> à moins que ce soit avec une arme à main, euh, on ne revient pas contre cette personne. Donc, euh, euh, oui, il peut y avoir un script, mais on ne sait jamais vraiment au fond ce qui fait partie d'un script et ce qui représente vraiment un combat réel. Et dans toutes les professions, dans tous les domaines, nous le savons tous bien, euh, 
il y a souvent des compétitions, surtout si on est là, il y a toujours quelqu'un qui, qui voudrait nous remplacer. Donc, euh, il y a toujours cette question, si vous voulez, de l'avarice la qui a toujours joué dans la, dans la condition humaine. Euh, bon, voilà. Alors, ce que je, euh, je vais vous proposer aujourd'hui, c'est euh, peut-être l'image du, du catch, mais à, à travers du prisme, euh, la lentille, pour le dire ainsi, de l'historique de mon père. Et euh, je, je vais continuer euh, en anglais, euh, parce que je n'ai pas l'habitude de présenter en français, donc euh, à vous prions de m'excuser. Euh, J'ai changé aussi euh, un petit peu euh, le titre de ma présentation, parce que je me suis rendu compte que WrestleMania, c'est peut-être plus associé avec euh, la lutte du WWE. Donc, euh, euh, mon titre, c'est « My father, the wrestler, as a superhero and a sociocultural icon, or papa, the big Frenchman. » It is only in retros retrospect that I have begun to think about my father, Adrien Bayard-Jean, as a superhero and as a sociocultural icon. And uh, please allow me to introduce you to my father, Adrien, who is in the middle. Actually, um, I come from, or my father and my mother both came from the typically large French-Canadian families, La Revanche de la Crèche, uh, 11 children in my mother's family, 12 in my father's six boys and six girls. Um, in, him, in his time, the words superhero and sociocultural icon had not yet come of age. Nevertheless, the words superhero and sociocultural icon fit him to a T long before he had become a professional wrestler. At first, the image of the superhero was more in the French-Canadian tradition of the legendary Paul Bunyan. At six foot five, ça fait environ un mètre 98, and a muscular 230 pounds, my father was a giant. As a youth, like Paul Bunyan, my father had been a lumberjack. And like Paul Bunyan, Adrien Bayard-Jean was not an ordinary lumberjack. First, his strength and ability in downing large trees and then his agility, balance, and skill to walk across floating logs down a fast downstream river soon caught the attention and highly impressed the local population. Also, like Paul Bunyan, my father crossed the Canadian border and by the early 1950s had become a household name in the northeastern part of the United States. As opposed to Paul Bunyan, however, my father was now a professional wrestler and a living legend. Although Paul Bunyan was not a wrestler, it is also my father's superhero status that makes him more akin to the French-Canadian superhero than Roland Barthes' stereotype of the French wrestler in his mythology. That, for example, opposes wrestling to judo, whereas the latter is perceived as a sport and the first as a mere spectacle. Having personally practiced judo for two years, I can personally vouch that wrestling as it was practiced by my father closely resembles judo and is in fact a sport. <clears throat> was I good at judo? My sensei seemed to think so as he would have me do demonstrations for his other classes. It was then, however, that I began to realize how difficult it is to think and act on your feet, and as a result, to really appreciate my father's amazing talents. <clears throat> 
there was no comparison between my modest efforts and his uncanny abilities. Some college wrestling coaches also respected professional wrestling as a sport when they invited my father to do demonstrations for their college wrestling teams. Certainly, my father's sportsmanship was a part of this equation. In fact, sportsmanship was part and parcel of each match, and it was undoubtedly his extraordinary display of sportsmanship that enabled this big French Canadian to cross many other borders, such as the Mason-Dixon line, when he wrestled in places like Nashville, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, Houston, Texas, and New Orleans, Louisiana. He would cross still another international border and popular cultural reality when he wrestled in Japan. Indeed, when Adrien Bayard Jean wrestled sumo wrestlers in Japan, he may not have been the favorite. But contrary to the image of the salaud that Bart paints in his analysis of the French wrestler, and contrary to Bart's characterization of wrestling as a mere spectacle, it was my father's extraordinary strength and agility that had won him a contract in Japan where professional wrestling what has long held a, a privileged place in popular culture. The monumentally large crowds attested to the superhero status of wrestlers in post-war Japan. Before stadiums holding 100,000 people had become commonplace, my father had wrestled before a crowd of 100,000 100, people. The place was in the crater that had been formed by the World II bombing of Nagasaki. It was also while my father was in Japan that he received an offer for a movie role. Uh, the movie was the, holiday, uh, the Hollywood movie produced on site in Japan starring Marlon Brando, Tea House of the August Moon. My father was also under contract at that point to the California wrestling office and he declined. There may also have been other reasons. Uh, there is yet another significant comparison with the legendary French Canadian hero. I'm coming back to Paul Bunyan. Like him, my father's fame was well established uh, in Quebec prior to crossing the border into the United States. My father was one of six brothers, all possessing unusual strength and talents. And the lore of the Bayergeon brothers quickly spread throughout Quebec. One early story, I think, that illustrates this uh, is a story about the parish priest's car that had, with the melting of winter snows, slipped into a very deep ditch. My father and one of his brothers came to the rescue when they literally picked up the car and put it back on the road. By the way, this was in the early 1940s when cars were made of real metal. They were heavy. It was also during this period that the Bayergeon brothers started to train with the Dion brothers and perform in vaudeville. Aside from forming a six-man pyramid and other balancing acts, they each performed an act of sheer strength. Uncle Jean would tear the New York telephone book in two with his bare hands. Uncle Paul would um, climb a telephone pole, but he wasn't alone. He had a horse in tow. Uncle Charles would pull a bus with his teeth. And my father would lift a platform on his back 
The platform weighed 200 pounds, but with some 17, usually, here they say 15, but usually 17 heavy set men on board. It usually weighed in at about two tons. Um, I'd actually like to show a small movie. I'm sorry, the, I, I chose this particular uh, YouTube movie because it was in French and gave you some more images, but the sound is, is not very good. Um, <laughs> Expert très connu, hein? C'est très embêtant pour un ancien champion du monde, mais après tout, qui oserait tenir tête au formidable frère Bayarjon? Oh! La dernière image, je pense que venait d'une émission qui avait été tournée à Radio-Canada où il y avait eu euh, une, une dernière réunion avec les travail argent. Euh, bon, voilà. So, I think where I was with my presentation was my father was one of six brothers, all possessing unusual strength and talents. And the lore of the Bayergeon brothers had quickly spread throughout Quebec. It's something I had not answered, but actually, if you were to visit Le Musée de la Civilisation at Quebec, there is a permanent exposition about Les Frères Bayergeon. There's a small museum in their native town. And so even years after they, they were well known, their name continues to be part of Quebec's history. Uh, one, <clears throat> as the years passed, their fame continued to spread. <laughs> On one of my trips to Quebec, some journalists recounted the story of a radio announcer who had told drivers to avoid driving over the Quebec Bridge because the Bayer Jean brothers had picked it up and carried it off on their shoulders. By the late 1940s, the Bayer Jean brothers decided to use their talents, <clears throat> not by picking up the Quebec Bridge and carrying it off on their shoulders, but by becoming professional wrestlers. <laughs> 
And I think this part is really interesting because we've talked, you know, mentioned about going to school to become a professional wrestler. Uh, I mentioned that I had taken judo for two years and I thought that I was decent, but that my talents didn't, didn't begin to measure against what I would see my father do. And yet they did not go to school for professional wrestlers. They learned professional wrestling by spotting for each other, observation and spotting for each other. Uh, again, contrary to Roland Barthes' definition of the French professional wrestler, which opposed wrestling to judo, there was, in my father's style, a definite use of judo moves. My father clearly demonstrated what Bout calls measured gestures that correspond to uh, his definition of judo. His gestures were precise and restricted and drawn accurately, but without a stroke of full volume. I promise you, if he had used full volume, he would have knocked out his opponent in the first minute. And so it was, I mean, as you do when you practice judo, you want to conquer your opponent you want to throw him down, but your objective is not necessarily to knock him out. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, my father, they had invited him to do boxing. He was not comfortable with boxing, uh, may have done a few boxing matches, but one of the things he used to say is after a while, boxers get punchy. And of course, we all know the example of Muhammad Ali. Uh, still, uh, as in Bout's description, of the French style of wrestling, which in this case also applies to the American style, there were excessive gestures that were exploited to the limit of their meaning. Certainly my father's physique and rapport with the public played into the aspect of showmanship that characterizes professional wrestling in various cultures. Yet, at the end of the day, it was the sport with its demonstrations of strength, agility, balance, and quick thinking, rather than the mere spectacle that impressed his public. Was he good? Hmm. After having trained with his brothers, he had decided to try his luck in New York <coughs> City, where professional wrestling was enjoying great popularity in the early 1950s. Logic tells me that there was a bit more than luck involved when by his third week in New York, he catapulted to fame in the northeastern part of the United States when he wrestled in the main event in New York City's Madison Square Garden. At first, the news media had called him Samson of the Mat. But the name that eventually stuck was that of the big Frenchman. As a child, I could be fairly smug when I said to my friends, my daddy is stronger than your daddy. And I could get away with it because he was appearing on television up to three times a week and just about everybody knew who my daddy was. More important, however, even then, I knew that he was a source of inspiration to many people. It was my father's inspirational role that made him much more than a sport and show business person. He was a sociocultural icon. His physique and strength, did you notice how I quickened up here, uh, represented an ideal of physical conditioning that has informed our <laughs> conscious and subconscious psyche since Greco-Roman times. During his wrestling matches, this six foot, five inch giant gave evidence of a balance and agility akin to that of Olympic gymnasts. And people knew that they were witnessing an extraordinary display of human ability. What is more, the traditional representation between good and evil, it was, he was the quintessential good guy, a force for good, even when others broke the rules and behaved badly. Thus, even when showmanship became part of the wrestling match, he excelled at being the good sport. Although his image as the good guy was at time enhanced by a name of biblical significance with which the media had christened him Samson of the Mat. Uh, 
neither the image of the good guy nor that of Samson was gratuitous. In a very real sense, he earned both the good guy image and that of the iconic biblical figure. He may not have fought the Philistines, but the drama that took place in the ring did represent the eternal struggle between good and evil that informs the human condition. There was another drama that unfolded in the ring. Although my father barely spoke English in the early 50s, he was quick to establish a rapport with his audience through his wrestling strategies and gestures. Within his repertoire of wrestling moves and holds, there were four elements that stood out over all the others in his matches. All of them crowd pleasers, and most of them displays of strength, agility, and balance. There was the rocking Nelson, where he managed to overpower his opponent in such a manner as to be able to do pinwheels with him around the ring. Another move was the airplane spin, where he was able to hold even a 300-pound man, not at the shoulder length as we saw in yesterday's move, movie, but above his head, and proceed to spin with him. This move, or these moves, again emphasize the sport aspect of the profession, since it represented a mastery of wrestling technique, rather than an opportunity to view what Bout refers to as an externalized image of torture. The second iconic move, uh, I, and I talked about it, which was the airplane plane spin. The crowds marveled at the rocking Nelson move and the airplane spin. There was also an unusual evasive move he would execute to foil an opponent's attempt to put a hold on him. This six foot five giant would jump up on the wrestling ropes that encircle the ring and walk along the ropes. These ropes were obviously lax and that made the feat all the more impressive. Those manifestations of superior abilities would bring the house down. The public knew that they were witnessing something truly extraordinary in terms of strength, agility, and balance. Finally, in a classical manifestation of professional wrestling that more closely approximates Bout's definition of the spectacle, at the end of the match when my father held his opponent at his mercy, he would look to the crowd in an appeal for their input as to how he should proceed. It was as if ensuing victory belonged to everyone. When he pinned his opponent down to the count of three with emphasis on his superior mastery of the sport, albeit, rather than Bout's notion of torture. This big French Canadian who wore his signature maple leaf on his robe had indeed crossed both physical and cultural borders to become a sociocultural icon when the news media had baptized him as Samson of the Mat, but more important by the public's admiration and adulation on both sides of the border. His fan clubs quickly grew, and I remember feeling proud when my father did strength exhibitions for boys clubs. In California, my father and his brother Paul were America's tag team champions. It was in Atlanta, Georgia, however, that newspaper men started to call him the Big Frenchman, although he always used his own name, almost finished. Okay. <laughs> uh, Adrien Bayer Jean was not an easy name for Americans to pronounce but they remembered it. Even when it was Americanized to Bayajan or Balarjan, and of course, they remembered the big Frenchman. It was in Louisiana, however, towards the end of my father's career, that he would be instrumental in transgressing an established negative social, sociocultural stereotype. In Louisiana, during a number of decades, and up until the 1960s, being Acadian, or Cajun as they are most often called, had become a derogatory denotation. The Cajuns were generally stigmatized for both their French language and their French culture. Louisiana's former Secretary of State, Wade Martin, took note of that period of negative stereotyping during his speech at the 1965 Acadian bicentennial celebration, as he recalled that speaking French on school grounds had been 
a punishable act. And I quote, unhappily, we must also mention that period in our history, now happily ended, when our children, and in fact some of us here present, were committed, were punished for the offense of speaking French while attending public school. Dr. Barry Soleil of the University of Louisiana at Lafayette recall the effects of that political policy. Older Cajuns who had written, I will not speak French on the school ground a few thousand times, had learned the lesson well and avoided inflicting on their own children what was long considered a cultural and linguistic deficiency. Do you want me to stop? I'm almost finished. Okay. Uh, my father, who had first wrestled in Lafayette, Louisiana in 1960, was already well known and well liked by the Cajun people when we moved to the area in 1962. In fact, he was already a heroic figure that had come to Lafayette from the outside, but had formed an instant bond with the people. My papa was French Canadian. He spoke to them in French. It was evident to the Acadians that he valued them for their language and their culture. What is more, the big Frenchman's popularity across the board transgressed racial and cultural lines of demarcation of the early 1960s. Whether we were at the supermarket, the gas station, or a school event, People of all backgrounds would run up to my father and ask to shake his hand. For them, there was only one Adrien Bayergeon and his superhero status as a wrestler and as a Francophone cultural icon transcended the other more mundane realities of race, culture, and ethnicity. Thus, when people heard my last name, they would always ask if I was related to Bayergeon, the wrestler. There was one comment in particular, and I am closing. Uh, that crystallized for me my father's role as a socio-cultural icon and as a superhero for the Acadian people. Warren Perrin, former president of the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana, remembers my father in this manner. My memory of your dad was one of being so proud to see someone on television, Channel 10, every Saturday afternoon, who was a hero figure, and spoke French. He inspired many young Cajuns to feel good about being part of a shared heritage, Francophones. Um, I can end in this way and summarizing Mr. Rowan's comments, uh, maybe in a Hollywood fashion, my papa fought with might for what was right. <laughs>